And to me, those those stories really resonate. And I wish everybody could sort of experience that because where you are, wherever that is, you have the same potential. It's more and more important when you communicate all those things and the, uh, the power of trans transformation in urban spaces to make possible to, for people to imagine another situation in the future when you transform the urban space. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's really difficult to make them understand. Billy, Manu, welcome back to the Active Towns channel. Hello, thanks, great to be back. Hello, thanks to be back. It's great to be back here again, yeah. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, uh, let's take this opportunity just to introduce yourselves real quick. Uh, Manu, uh, where are you joining us from? And tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm joining from Seville. Uh, that's the city where I live, where I work from here. And I've been living here for uh, the last 25 years. And, and actually around Seville for all of my life, actually. But well, I'm an independent uh, consultant and I'm a specialist or an expert in sustainable mobility systems and sustainability as a whole. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. And, and Manu, you and I have had the opportunity to meet several times, uh, once here in the United States and then uh, also there in, in Seville. And uh, and sustain sustainability is a big, big part of Billy's life, too. Billy, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Fields uh, from Texas State University. I'm a professor there in political science. And I lead student groups to the Netherlands in the summer as part of the International Sustainable Transportation Engagement Program, ISTEP. And this summer, we led professionals to Spain uh, and examined Barcelona, Valencia. And then with Manu, we were in Sevilla. And it was just a pleasure to get to see the system and understand the system and how it was built and really experience it. And I hope, I hope that's what we get at today is this sort of feeling of experience that's so different when you're in a connected, protected system. Yeah, yeah. And Billy, you, you've actually published a book, you know, on sort of this topic. Why don't you give your book a, a quick plug? Ah, oh, thanks. Uh, it's called Adaptation Urbanism. And what we do in Adaptation Urbanism is we're really interested in the concept of resilience and how resilience works. And essentially, we're trying to figure out how to tie uh, climate adaptation and climate mitigation together in the built environment. And the best way to do that is through walking and biking facilities that pair with green infrastructure. Uh, so what you end up with is just a connected system with green, soaks up water, and then in, in Seville's case, uh, it also protects against heat. So when you create those type of systems, you create better places. And we look at case studies from all over the world of how cities are beginning to move in that direction, and then some of the challenges as they move forward with that. Yeah, you mentioned the word heat, and uh, heat is going to come up as a, a common theme. Uh, you know, the one of the biggest challenges, of course, with Seville and uh, also with Austin, Texas, where uh, you and I are located here, uh, Billy, uh, it is, yeah, it the glo with global warming, it is getting hotter and hotter and more and more challenging. Uh, Billy, to pause for just a second. And you had mentioned that you take students along and you do this experiential thing. But what we're going to be really talking about here today is sort of an extension or, or a pivot to uh, or an, an add on to your, uh, your your student related activity. Talk a little bit about the context of what we are going to be talking about today and talk a little bit about that journey, that experiential journey that you guys were on. Yeah, maybe I'll just start with a, my own personal experiential journey. The picture on the on the left is the Torre del Oro uh, in Sevilla. And I was a student way, way back when, we won't name the year, uh, but I brought my bicycle to Seville and it opened doors for me. It was really the first time that I saw what it would feel like. And I used to go on bike rides that would leave right from this same spot. Um, and coming back a very long time later, decades later, uh, what was amazing was that the spaces that before that it had no bicycle facilities and very few cyclists, now had in lots of cyclists and the system uh, was built so that it was very safe and easy and connected. And that experience 
for myself of going from, you know, a long time ago experiencing this place and coming back and seeing this radical transformation was, was really special. And what's interesting for people in Sevilla, and I think Manu uh, talked to this when we were there, is now there's whole generations of kids that are growing up who just think this is the way it is. Of course, we have a connected, protected system. This is just how things are. And being a little bit older, I get to watch how that changes over time and how it opens up possibilities for you. And for me, that was, for, uh, individually, that was the story. In terms of the professional group, we had a number of different professionals with different backgrounds, and we traveled both in the Netherlands, and then we came uh, to Spain to look at the really great best practice projects that we're uh, developing. And what we saw was that cities can be transformed over time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later, I think, about some locations that Manu talked to us about where there were car parking for decades, and then the car parking disappears, and then people arrive. And that story and that experience is really what was what we were after with the ISTEP program uh, this summer. Great. Fantastic. And Manu, thank you so very much for for doing this, uh, to meet, meeting up with Billy and that group. Uh, I put the two of you in contact. I was supposed to be on that group, uh, but uh, uh, I just wasn't able enough, uh, wasn't able to raise enough funds to be able to do that. Uh, you know, the the budget that I'm able to uh, accommodate here as a YouTuber is uh, is quite modest. So I, I do appreciate that, Manu. Uh, I, I hope they were okay. It was, was it a well-behaved group? <laughs> Yeah, they were, but it it wasn't okay. I mean, uh, you you weren't here, so uh, <laughs> it, it, could, it couldn't be okay. <laughs> you, you are you are very very kind. I, I appreciate that. Well, hey, uh, Billy uh, and Manu, uh, this is kind of your show. I'm gonna I'm gonna moderate just a little bit, and uh, and I'm driving the PowerPoint, so I have a little bit of control over this. But really, this is your story to tell, and this is my selfish way of being able to participate a little bit and uh, uh, live vicariously through what you saw, since I wasn't there. <laughs> so. So I'll turn it over to the two of you a little bit here, and uh, and then I'll ask questions along the way. So uh, let's get started. Well, maybe I could explain a little bit for a couple of minutes how this began, actually, because it wasn't easy. Uh, I mean, uh, even though, as uh, Billy just told us, that the, uh, the kids or the children around or the, from Seville, they just think that it's the way it is, uh, it, it wasn't that easy at when in 2003, there were a couple of people actually that had the political will and the decision-making power in order to uh, make this happen. Actually, they were on a coalition uh, government, local government at that time, and then they had the power, as I said, to decide to expend uh, some money on uh, on uh, bike infrastructure and bike facilities. So they... Uh, they, they gather actually 19 million euros or 18 million euros, if I don't remember uh, wrongly, to back infrastructure. And they also decided to do something that was quite remarkable at that time. And it's still remarkable uh, nowadays. And it's uh, making the decision of having a whole network. And this word, uh, the concept of networking, is essential in this process. I mean, they decided to have that network of bike facilities and bike lanes and bike infrastructure built in a really short period of time. So we went from 15 unconnected pieces of bike lanes that were from nowhere to nowhere, actually. In two years, in from 2006 to 2008, we had a 80 kilometers, that's uh, maybe 55 miles or so, of a connected, continuous, and homogeneous uh, bike network and bike facility. So it was easy, actually, and comfortable to use the bike. Yeah. So now, no, actually, Manu, yeah. let me let me jump in real quick and, and just make sure we're getting some context here. Uh, so again, this was kind of at that economic meltdown period that sort of took place in, in, in the years leading up to that. Uh, I see the, the photo on screen right now uh, with, of Emilio. Was he involved at that time or is, or is this a, 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 a newer player in the, scheme, in the scene at this point? 
Yeah, Emilio took the uh, bike office, I think, in 2014. If okay, I don't. so more a little bit more yeah. recent, yeah, in that yeah, context. It, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's needed to, you know, to understand that uh, the, uh, one, the that decision was made actually to have that network and, and to promote cycling as a mode of transportation, of urban mobility around the city. Uh, that was two, 2003. That's 20 years ago. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. It's a long, a long ago, and so we were, uh, we, we were designing for a couple of uh, of years, and I say we because I was involved on that team, that group of people that were thinking about how to do the things, and uh, we came out with a, what we called at that time a basic uh, network of infrastructure, those eighty kilometers. Right. Yeah. Uh, in, in and, and actually, we see that right now on screen. If you can see this, Manu. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is the graph of the protected cycle path. And you're absolutely correct. You know, when you look at 1990, there's basically zero <laughs> that, that are really there. And then it looks like there was 12 kilometers uh, on the ground in 2006. But then it just exploded as you were able to, you know, really leapfrog up. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And folks, if, if you haven't already uh, listened to my uh, interviews with uh, Manu uh, from the past, uh, we actually go into detail, you know, this sort of evolution of the Seville bicycle network. And, uh, and, and actually, you know, that's a good point. Let's, let's jump over to this screen for just a second, because I want to actually give you both a plug in terms of uh, the fact that you've both been on the podcast before which is, you know, I certainly appreciate you, you know, A, being on the podcast before and coming back again. So I want to make sure that we we go back in time because Manu, you were actually on the, the podcast way back in 2020. Uh, in August of 2020, you were on the podcast and we talked about that history of the that experience that took place. And, uh, and in fact, you know, if we, we pull this up, yeah, that was way back in season one in episode 39. And we went through and talked about this. Now, folks, this was an audio only episode back at that time. So uh, there's lots of photos and some rich uh, imagery here on the landing page for that particular episode. It, but really, we go into the, the history and the background of the civil experience. But then I w welcomed you back on again for a second time. But before we get to that, I want to get to Billy because uh, Billy, you came on the podcast like a couple years later in August of 2022. So last August. And, and you talked about uh, your book and you were able to, to go through some uh, of of the activities that you're doing, including we did a little reflection on your Dutch summer school from 2022. And so I do want to mention that those two episodes are available on, on audio only. And then this one is also available on the video. And then that final time, uh, Manu, I had you back on uh, a second time this year, and we went through uh, really the evolution of, of the Seville Bicycle Network. So we, we, we wanted to do it again because it was a couple years later, three years later. Um, and so we had you back on again, again, episode number 173 in season five. So you were with me way back in season one, then you came back again in season five. And we went through and talked about, you know, that evolution that took place. I, uh, I focused on or actually profiled one of my videos about Sevilla and how that bicycle network, uh, you know, was out there. So I, I just wanted to pause just for a second to to give the audience an opportunity to understand that we may skip through some of the historical context on this particular uh, reflections because we really want to focus in on a what the update is to because we've got a political environment that's changing quite quickly there in Seville. <laughs> and then also give Billy the, that opportunity to f reflect a little bit on having gone back to Seville for the first time in many, many years. 
to, to, you know, talk a little bit about that reflection. Okay. So thank you very much for that little commercial break to, to, to acknowledge the fact that you both have been on the podcast multiple times before and on the Active Towns channel. Let's get back to this graph of the protected uh, cycle path and, uh, and we'll really try to, you know, have that dialogue going back and forth in, in terms of why this is so incredibly significant. And I guess the one thing I'll in, in, exemplify right now is again, looking at this graph, that steep, steep curve going up once, you know, that the, the economic meltdown happened and you took that opportunity to put people back to work and start building out that cycle network. Yeah. And, and John, if you go, I think it's the next slide where I kind of zoom in on that. Yeah. And I, when we were there, one of the interesting stories that Mano you told was how that system was built uh, with eight different companies uh, taking on parts of the system, basically to help ensure that the whole system got built, even if uh, one part of the system, one company didn't do as uh, as good a job as they might have, especially during those troubled economic times. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about how that system, you know, really pumped up so fast, because it just as an administrative sort of issue, that's a challenge to build that much that fast. And this is an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I think that the most important point here is that what we called a bike office or a cycling office was created into the urbanism department. So there were people experienced in the how to manage building and projects and the administrative process of make that happen. And it was uh, an office of at least 10 people that it reached eventually 18 people in 2011, working just making cycling an option, actually. So we, we haven't had this kind of effort invested, you know, great material effort uh, invested on, 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 on cycling ever. Uh, since those times. Uh, then a conservative uh, party took power in 2011 and they wiped out the uh, whole office. And when the uh, progressive came to power again in 2014, it, it was just 1.5 people, uh, one person and a half, you, can, you could say, at the bike office for the last eight years. And it was Emilio, actually, and, uh, and a partner that we also met uh, uh, on, on a meeting that we had, uh, Billy. Here, and and that and that's a very important issue, uh, point of the of the whole process to have people just thinking how to do that, because the administrative uh, process here in Spain, I guess it's it's the same everywhere. It's really hard to follow, and, and you know uh, it needs lots of people just taking care of of, of everything and all the issues administrative and, and, and bureaucracy, you could say about this. Uh, I mean, it's it's eight uh, companies, eight different projects, eight different, you know, whatever, that they have to be, uh, they have to be managed uh, properly and all at the same time. So that happened because there were a bunch of people just uh, taking care of this. Hey, Manu, can I ask a, a quick question? Um, I'm going to zoom in on the graph here a, a little bit. And it looks like uh, you had mentioned uh, that in 2011, uh, there was a political change and uh, the, the office was sort of decimated and all of that. But it does look like there was still a pretty good continual rise in the number of kilometers being built out between 2011 and 2014. And then there, it looks like there was a little bit of a stagnation and then it shot up again. Uh, it looks like right around 2016 or so. Is that a reflection of just the fact that the momentum was in place and because of those other eight you know, companies, subcontractors building it out, that it was baked in? And so it, it was just happening, even though the conservatives were, were in charge at that particular point in time? Yeah, there were like two steps, the first 80 kilometers and the second 40 until 120 in 2010. There was a national tool in order to improve economic proficiency in the country that and this kind of, of tools were cut for, because of the European Union in 2010, 2011. Okay, and that's why the, the Greek problem now that that's really 
um, um, yeah, really, really, really uh, complex to explain here now. But, you know, the national government for two times, they kind of took some money in order to improve economic efficiency uh, in the country. So uh, there were funds for the local governments in order to do that, and, and, you know, in order to make or build in some infrastructure related to sustainable mobility. And so about 10 million uh, or 12 million uh, were ex- expanded in, in Seville, were invested in Seville in 2010 and 2011. So uh, that, you, you can see in the graph is the iner- inertia of, uh, I don't know if you uh, uh, pronounce this in English, a- inertia that, that, that happened for, on the administrative uh, processes. And also there was also a, a local law that every new development and, and, and every new refreshment of European space, especially on the big avenues, it should have a bike lane. So there were some works that were adding some more kilometers that were connected. And those are pieces, just not network, but were connected to the, uh, uh, the, the core of the network that was made by the, uh, what we call the basic and, and the 120 kilometers at that time. So there were, but if, if you see, um, we'll, maybe we'll see it uh, later, the number of cyclists is is just it fits really really properly these political times, which is also a lesson that we must learn. Right. Yeah. Now, Billy, since you had that history of having been in Seville back in the day when you were, went to school there, you were able to see exactly this: how there was a repurposing of street space. How shocked or impressed were you when you were able to, to ride on it and go, wow, this is a lot different than what it was? Yeah, so uh, I actually was at the 1990 mark where there were no facilities. That's when I was there. Um, and I and there were the only people that you saw riding bikes then were uh, basically training cyclists. And that's what I was doing. So I was out on the street with cars, uh, kind of dodging dodging cars. And then One of the amazing things then and and still about European cities is how dense and compact they are. So I was able to just ride out of the city and then ride off into the olive groves, which was lovely. But within the city itself, there was some, you know, competitive movement with cars. Now you have no competitive movement. Everywhere we went with Manu was just completely easy. And it looks like the system like this. Basically, there were sections where the kind of cycle track you know, there was a big uh, space like the image on the left and the, and the cycle track was just kind of put in. Uh, and then Mono was telling us about other sections where they had basically removed car parking to put in the cycle track. And it worked really, really well. It was just nice, easy and attractive. And coming before that, we had been in the Netherlands where I also kind of move around easily without even thinking about being on a bike. And the Sevilla experience felt exactly the same. Really easy, nice together, just, just hotter than it was. Yeah, in just hotter, yeah. So, Manu, um, why don't you speak to to uh, this a little bit of, you know, what were those? And again, we we talk about this extensively in our previous conversation, so we don't have to go in depth in it. But just real briefly, talk a little bit about what the inspirations were that you drew upon, and then. Uh, customized for your own environment uh, there, and why you know why a cycle track and why protect it? Well, of course, we uh, our inspiration came from other cycling cities such as uh, Copenhagen or Amsterdam or Utrecht or whatever. Well, the the really well known cities that people just cycle around and they don't actually think that they're on a bike, as just Billy told us. We figured it out, or we thought that actually how to start, it was a missing gap when you don't have anything at all. And that happens on mostly most of the cities here there in the United States. And then suddenly you go to Amsterdam, where 35 or 40, uh, 40% of the people just cycle around. And, and the change is so, so amazing that, uh, you know, the first thing you think is that the, the, these guys are crazy. You know, and it's and it's another culture, and you know they they have the the bike in in their DNA or whatever. So we we're not those kind of guys, and and we're not going to be a successful if you do any of this. So what we learned is that we had to create 
space for thinking, actually, how to make that missing gap of going from nothing to something. And for us, as I told you, it was network, separated cycle lanes from traffic, bi-directional and not unidirectional, which is the, the, the um, most of the infrastructure there on the center of Europe. And we just went for it. And actually, as a matter of fact, we did not know at the moment that we were going to be that successful. <laughs> That's the truth. You know, even for us that we're just uh, designing and planning the whole thing. Well, and, and, and we put it into context, too. You, you know, Manu, you and I talked about this extensively. You put it into context. It's like it, it was right at the time of the economic meltdown in 2007, 2008, et cetera. And, you know, it, it's like you have, like, look at in these images here, you have these wide, wide auto infrastructure, auto sewers. And so the point was, is that there's so many people out of work there's really not that much, there's no traffic to speak of. It's like there, you had an opportunity, a unique opportunity in a moment in time to do just this, repurpose street space while at the same time putting some people back to work in building out this cycle network. And I'll emphasize once again, because you guys did something truly extraordinary, you built out an entire network, that first network, what was it? That first 80 kilometers to hundred kilometers. That first network was like 18 months, right? Two years. And, and that, was, that, that was just, well, it was just before the economic meltdown. We, we remember the, the whole, the Lehman Brothers uh, thing happened in September, 2008. So by that time, that we already had the basic network, and we had the money actually to do that because of <laughs> it was just before the uh, the meltdown. The uh, additional forty kilometers that came in two thousand ten was a try off of the natural government in order to improve the economy. But then you know the debt problem here in Europe came in 2010, 2011. and after that, uh, not a lot was actually done. On, on Seville, uh, in, or, or in the whole Spain or, or whole Europe for five or six years. Yeah. So, Billy, wh when I look at this photo here, I immediately think of you. Can you tell me why? The photo on the left. Hmm. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> I like the trees. Uh, I like Mondo yeah. riding in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Tree, tree, tree canopy. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so we're talking about a very hot environment and it, it was so wonderful uh, to, and, and I appreciated the fact that there was the shade that there was, you know, throughout the entire uh, network. And, and I do want to emphasize too, that this is just outside the historic core of the, the city center, the, you know, so it's outside the wall of, of what would be the ancient city. And that's the reason why we have these wide streets and everything and why we were able to, to repurpose some of these lanes, but this is a hot environment. And so whenever we can have access to a uh, shade canopy and tree canopy, uh, and, and also help with, you know, some of uh, whatever we can do from a stormwater perspective when it does rain uh, is, is super, super helpful. Manu, talk a little bit about that side of things in terms of trying to create some green aspects, to, you know, to the, the network and, uh, and whenever possible getting some shade. Well, actually, that wasn't planned. Uh, well, I, I think, Billy, you could say that Seville is a city with lots of trees. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, any other uh, city that you might think, especially in the United States, maybe. Yeah, uh, I have my favorite tree, guys. I have my favorite tree. You do? <laughs> yeah. Do you know which one it is, uh, Manu, um, from uh, when uh, Clarence and I were there? Mm, it's very prominent remember. in the videos. The jacarandas were the jacarandas oh. were in bloom, and they're just absolutely yeah. gorgeous. You have this pop of color. Uh, and, and I think this is, it, it's, it, it really adds to the, the, the beauty of the environment. Well, you could also have, or you can also have, uh, in April or springtime, the, uh, orange flowers 
because you have good, lots of orange trees and the smell is just gorgeous. Uh, so uh, the thing is that in almost in every avenue, there's a tree line in both sides of the avenue. And the, uh, the parking space in line, the, in the line of parking space was uh, located just on one side of the uh, tree uh, line. When we got rid of that space, parking space, and then we placed the uh, bike lane on top of it, you know, we, we were under the trees, actually. We were, we were having shade for the cars, <laughs> which is crazy. And, and uh, yeah, and, and now we have uh, that shade for, for cycling, which is great. And Manu, you had mentioned the fact that it, it was a really, really hot summer there. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, for us in Texas, we had a brutally, brutally hot. I think it's the hottest summer on record since uh, record keeper keeping has been taking place. Uh, this is critical, right? To be able to keep people riding throughout the hottest times is being able to have access to shade. Yeah, what, what happens is that the uh, the life of the city just goes down in every possible way. So there's less people working, less people moving around, less cyclists, of course. But th there's still some, uh, which, uh, and that actually surprises me. <laughs> you know, so well, you it, it makes a big difference if you can get some shade, though. Yeah, I mean, it makes a huge difference if you can get some shade. So uh, that's good. Professor, this is one of your areas of, of interest and in study I, from a resiliency standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint. Um, how important is this from, you know, when we look at, you know, the challenges uh, that cities are facing from a global warming and a climate resiliency perspective are having these trade, you know, these tree canopies? Just from start with it, we, we talk about experience. When we, when we were there, you could feel the difference in the different spaces. So on the image on the right, you can see where we're kind of out and there's less uh, shade. It was really, really hot. Uh, and if the whole system was like that, you probably wouldn't be out using it in the middle of the day. Uh, but under the trees, it was actually, it, I mean, I wouldn't say pleasant in the middle of the day, but it was very doable. So if you think about it, Bicycling infrastructure requires that green infrastructure in a, in a hot climate. You have to have that shade to utilize the system. And then uh, at various points in time, you'll be in a drought and you need, uh, you need that tree canopy for uh, you know, the summer. Uh, at other points of, of time, you'll have intense rainfalls. That's what we're seeing with climate change. It's this kind of yo-yo back and forth. And the green infrastructure, trees, bioswales, all of those combined together to create basically climate adaptive environments. And it's climate adaptive in terms of water and water management, but it's also climate adapted for people to be continuing to use the spaces. Uh, and I love when you're able to put in those bioswales as buffers between the cars as well. And that's something I, I didn't see as much of in Sevilla, but that's something that I think could really be added as well. There's a, there's a lot to sort of look at to integrate those two factors. And as, as Manu was saying, they just sort of built the bike system and then got lucky with the tree canopy. But other cities trying to be strategic about that, I think is going to be really crucial in the future. So Manu, you had mentioned, you know, earlier, and I think Billy, you did as well, that, you know, who decides to come out and cycle is important. And we've already noticed it in some of the images that we've seen uh, here and here is that we knew we were successful here with this because we saw that the female uh, started riding. We started to see women uh, riding. We started to see women with children riding. I mean, how just absolutely gratifying was that, Manu, for, for you guys to be like, yeah, we, we did it. We created some, uh, uh, an environment with, that felt safe enough where everybody can utilize the, the facilities and, you know, where you have basically, you know, very, very few, almost zero, you know, women and children riding for regular utilitarian purposes. Now you're able to, to show some really extraordinary numbers in terms of the number of females feeling safe enough to be out there. Yeah, uh, actually, there's 
uh, a complementary indicator uh, that tells us a lot about this issue is if you only count the urban bikes and no sport bikes, you know, mountain bikes and race bikes and those females or women are 50 something percent. I mean, it's more than the, than the half of the, of the cyclists that use urban bikes. So actually not just the percentage has grown from 15% to 37, as you said, you can see in the slide. It's also that they're using the bike for utilitarian or for everyday use or daily use, you could say. And that's something really amazing. It's a, a clear indicator that the uh, network and the infrastructure or, it's, or, or just cycling around Seville is comfortable and, and it, you feel safe, which is something essential for women to, to get on the bike. Yeah. Billy, comments on that? Definitely, you saw that in Sevilla. And that's similar as well to the Netherlands. When, when you stop seeing differences among gender or age, that's when you know your system is working really well. And you start to, and you definitely felt that in Sevilla and, and in, the, in, in the sort of best practice cities we referenced earlier. Yeah. I want to focus in on this, uh, this photo in the bottom right corner here and, and then skip ahead to photos and uh, into this slide, because I think it, it speaks to that sense of creativity and understanding that you didn't have the time necessarily, the money to do things perfectly. So you just you, you shoehorned it in, literally. And sometimes that meant preserving a tree and at the same time doing the cycle track around the tree. Talk a little bit about that spirit of uh, creativity and doing what you could to get the, the network down. And, uh, and, and, and like, you know, Billy has on here, not everything is perfect, but it works. The infrastructure had to be continuous and not having any uh, disconnections. So, as you said, we applied creativity in order, of course, to save that tree that you see on the uh, slide. But I have to say that the main problem here is uh, where to get the space from. And the main problem is not the lack of creativity or lack of money. It's the enormous difficulty of having or taking that time from uh, th that space from, uh, from cars. Right. And the uh, fight, the technical fight, if you want to call, like, call it like that, with the uh, traffic engineers. You know, they've been educated for a century that they need capacity for cars. And then suddenly you're telling them that you need to take that, just some of that tiny, maybe 10% of that capacity to give them to uh, bikes. And they just look at you and say, I I'm thinking that you're crazy. Yeah. And that's the main problem. We, we had to be creative because of that problem, actually. Be, because actually, if you, if you look at that picture, you can see that maybe 70% of, of the section of that street is, is, uh, is for cars. Right. So uh, th th there's, there's no need to be so creative with that tree, actually. We had to do that uh, back in 2000. Uh, six in 2007 because you know the situation was like it was but actually on that uh, section of the avenue as billy can tell us there was uh, a project built two years ago and it's very different you know we we, we took that bike lane to the uh, to the uh, to, to the street level or to to road level and it's much wider no trees at all in the middle but just on, on the side but not in the middle and it's just great to cycle there. Hmm? Yeah, fantastic. I, I do want to uh, go back to the heat just a bit because I forgot we had, we did have a slide that really hones in on this. But this actually features something we didn't talk about, which is putting up actual shade structures and creating shade when you don't have the ability to um, have trees. And we see the forty degrees Celsius uh, on this on the screen there. Now. Just to be on record with this, Manu, I told Billy he was crazy to go to <laughs> Spain in July. Uh, and and I was like, hey, if, if you change this to like October, or November, I'm totally there. And of course, as luck would have it, Billy's heading back to Europe 
you know, soon. And so we could have done it. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I know you couldn't do it then, <laughs> Billy, but I'm, I just had to that, razz that you tell, a little bit. John, that's the real reason why you didn't come. Actually. Yeah, that's the real reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that plus a trip, a, a trip to, to Colorado too, where the the temperatures were really nice. Uh, but yeah, so so talk a little bit about that. I mean, what's the temperature today? You know, there in in Seville. Well, we are just starting uh, uh, a really rare and strange heat wave. <laughs> oh my gosh! October. So you're we're going gonna, back up? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna beat records, uh, temperature records in, in this in this coming week. Yeah. Uh, today, I think. Let me check, but I think we are uh, reaching always in Celsius. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> we, we're reaching 36 today. Okay. All right. uh, so well, not 40, 30, though. You know, not 40. That's no, good. no. Yeah, but, but you have to take into account that, that that's on the airport. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, a, in into a shade, you know. At, yeah. at plain sun. Uh, we're we're gonna have today 42. Yeah. Okay. 40, All right. Well, we yeah. get the idea. It, it's hot there. We need, we need shade. Um, and this is an example of what you were talking about earlier, Manu, where we've got the shade into the bike lane, but we also have a wider bike lane. So this is one of the things that the city is trying to move towards is creating some, uh, some wider expanses and, and really sort of leaning into the fact that you all have proven this. You have put the network down, you got the women riding, in impressive numbers. And now incrementally, when you have that opportunity to improve upon it, you're trying to do that. Yes. I don't know if this is going to keep on happening. Okay. Because of the political change that we just had. And actually I have to say that in the last eight years, the uh, improvements have been really slow. And something that I also learned uh, during these years in the experience of Seville is that the uh, mo sustainable mobility experiences that we have and the, we go through actually are not cumulative. Uh, you could think that once you demonstrated that if, if you do things, things happen actually in Seville, it was, it was going to be much easier to do more things. But that, that, that hasn't happened actually. So Seville is, has improved a lot about cycling, especially in those first years, but has not done very much, if you compare it with other cities or the Spanish cities, about anything else, public transit, limitations to cars, our parking regulations, and all that. And actually the cycling mobility is stagnant from 2011, and uh, the year scooters uh, have come in into the back facilities also, they use the back facilities. Right now, we hit, we beat it also the record of users on the uh, back uh, infrastructure last year, but uh, a third of those users are e-scooters. Yeah, and you and I actually talk about that extensively in our most recent uh, episode. Billy, before we shift gears and, and start talking about public space, parking and reclaiming the city for people, which kind of shifts us into a little bit different direction. Final thoughts of what we're looking at right here, which is, you know, hopefully the future for Seville as they're able to, to move towards wider cycle lanes. Yeah, it's what's interesting about the core system. And I think you can see in this picture the uh over on the left-hand side is this old city wall. And Manu, just quickly, what, what year was that built? Uh, do, you, do you remember? Oh, like what era? Uh, the 12th century. Yeah, 12th century. So you've got this old, really historic city. And around the core, uh, as you were saying earlier, John, are these kind of bigger streets. So there's this kind of unique opportunity to create this system. And that, that part of the system works, I think, really, really well. And then offers this other opportunity to take additional space and create these sort of wide cycle lanes. And I'll also say that when we were in Valencia, uh, they have a similar sort of historic core. And Manu, uh, Giuseppe Gressi was telling me how they modeled their system, kind of learned from what you did in your system, and then took that forward. And to me, I, what we're really talking about is knowledge sharing. The knowledge sharing started in Amsterdam and Copenhagen, and then you took it in Sevilla and then Valencia took what you learned. And I, th I think what we, uh, particularly from a North American context, can learn 
is the value of those protected, connected and protected systems. Making a system that connects together is vital. Uh, and that's where you see your mode share changes. You see your wider demographic use of cycling facilities. And it can happen in you know, colder climates uh, like uh, Northern Europe, but it can also happen in warmer slash hotter places <laughs> like Sevilla. And I, that's the lessons, at least to me, that, that I really took away. It was great to be in Amsterdam one week and then Sevilla the next and feel like that system worked just as well in both places. Great. I appreciate you, you kind of buttoning that up. Okay, Billy, I'm going to have you do sort of a lightning round here uh, as we go through these uh, slides. We're, we're looking at public space. We're looking into some of the, what you just described of the knowledge learning of going from these different things, but you also found some really cool historical photos to sort of do some comparisons with. So uh, kick us off here and let me know. And, and real quick, just, you know, we'll go through each slide, say a few words, and uh, we'll pause for a second for Manu to, for you to reflect on any of these as well. Go ahead and kick us off, Billy. Uh, yeah, this comes from a conversation, Manu, just kind of threw out as an aside. We were walking through yet another beautiful public space. And Manu said, oh, well, this used to be cars and that used to be cars. All of these places had been car parking lots. And to me, the, the storyline of, of like my entire trip in Spain was all of these places that had been filled with cars now are spaces for walking, biking, and people. And that's really, in Spain, what you really, really saw was the, the sort of taking of public space, a little bit different than you have in the Netherlands. There's just this sort of culture of public space. And Manu, I, this one especially, I think, is, is vital for the city. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about this shot and how kind of transformative and difficult politically this was. Well, that's the Avenida de la Constitución. And it was uh, also a, re a remarkable story because once I, I told you that the decision about cycling was made in, in, into a coalition between the socialists, which is, is sort of the, your Democrat party there in, in the United States, and a tiny party from the left. So they got together for a coalition uh, in, in 2003. And so the people from that tiny party decided the whole thing about cycling and everything. And what happened is that, you know, they were being really successful and they were winning the urban dialogue about sustainable mobility on that time in Seville. So the mayor that was actually from the Socialist Party thought, and I, I think they did, he did it correctly, that he had to do something. He had to do something about, you know, uh, public space in pedestrianization and all that. So he decided in just maybe some days to to have that transformation on the uh, one of the biggest avenues in this historical center and, and to place a tram there. So he had a couple of projects and but you know they lots of back and forth we're gonna do it but they, they never did and and then he decided suddenly to do it before the uh, local elections in 2007. So they they built that in, in less than a year. <laughs> really fast to have it uh, just before the uh, local elections. And the transformation was huge. And that's another of the, well, uh, you know, no one in Seville right now could think that motorized mobility could return to that street, actually. So it's so just, imprecated into the uh, urban culture of the historical center of Seville uh, in this, uh, this time. And, you know, but it, it's been difficult to do it everywhere else. That's, that's what I meant when I thought it was, it, th that knowledge, uh, that experience was not cumulative. And that's really very strange. Mm -hmm. It's, it's too bad. But Billy, I mean, we, we see this globally, right? I mean, it's like, it, it's a fight to, to try to make these transformations, but once they are made, it's like nobody can imagine going back. Yeah. And then, but to Manu's point, that's the interesting part is they can't imagine going back, but then they can't imagine changing anything else either. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Even if, even if what we are used to is despotic, we're comfortable with it. You know, the, the image on the left of all the cars, it's like, yeah, that's what we're used to. And so change 
is is fear fear inducing, and because we're, we 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 as humans we adapt so quickly and so you know and we're used to what we have outside our our, our homes and out on our streets, so it's it's fear inducing and change is scary. But then afterwards, as humans, we're like, oh yeah, this is better. What were we afraid of? <laughs> and and maybe the story is that there's always going to be tension when you make change. And if you're waiting till there's no tension, you're never going to get there. At some point, you just need to do it. And when you do it, it, it really transforms. And uh, in that last uh, shot, John, if we go back for just a second, Manu was telling us about uh, this space. And this space, I, I think, uh, Manu, you were saying it had flooded at a particular time and uh, there were cars and there was all sorts of uh, sort of difficulty with that particular spot. And I think that's close to your neighborhood. So maybe you could tell us about sort of that transformative nature there. Well, that's the Plaza de la Alameda. And as you told us, uh, Bill, it used to be, uh, you know, a couple of roads and uh, lots of uh, parked uh, cars all around and inside the plaza, actually. And this was one of the uh, of the projects I told you about about the transformation in the city that happened from 2003 to 2007, and the uh, leadership of that transformation was also of the of the uh, tiny part of the coalition, and that's why <laughs> the mayor just you know trying to uh, to oppose that he he went on up for the transformation of, of a couple of other spaces on the city center. It was kind of a very good competition between partners actually into the uh, local government. And those years, well, lots of things were uh, were done actually about uh, sustainable mobility and get rid of the cars in many places. And about the, the uh, topic that we we're talking about, I think it's it, it's more and more important when, when you communicate all those things and the uh, the power of trans transformation in urban spaces to make possible to, for people to imagine another situation. And all the tools we could use in order to do that, uh, they are really welcomed, because uh, you ha you need the the people need to imagine how this is gonna be in the future when you transform the urban space. Otherwise, uh, you know it's really difficult to make them understand. And, and you know, I, a couple of months ago ha happened something in Barcelona that it's it's been remarkable. There were a bunch of uh, commercial associations that denounced on the, uh, to the judge the transformations in some parts of Barcelona. And then the judge said that this transformation had to be returned to the before, you know, to the, uh, to the before the transformation because they were illegal and all that stuff. And even the people that, were, that went to the judge, they're saying now, no, no, we better, we better just skip them. Like, like, like it's right now because, you know, we like it. <laughs> so it's just crazy. Yeah. And I, I think that's what's interesting about this sort of knowledge sharing. You learn from one place, you implement it. And then once it's there, people really like it. And these are just a couple of images from the St. Anthony uh, Super Ila in Barcelona. And then the Consul de Sant, which is that trans, that might have been the one you're talking about in Barcelona. Sure. But it's unbelievable. It is. It, yeah, an entire street that looks in the upper image, you see, it just is a regular street. And now it is a green street all the way through the heart of the city. It is unbelievable. There's a water square associated with it. You go out in the evening and it's just kids and older folks and everybody in between walking on the street. And then cars can slowly move through here. But why would they? Because it's hard. So they go somewhere else or they evaporate. Uh, and that's one of the sort of pieces of uh, research that's popping up is about this idea of traffic evaporation. And when traffic evaporates, people appear. Uh, and that's really what you see in these in these images here. Yeah. So, Billy, you've had, had had the opportunity to, you know, sort of let a lot of this settle in. And that's kind of what we wanted to do is to, to give you a few weeks to let all this sort of you know, the dust settle and, and get your, your, your thoughts straight and go through some of these photos. So I appreciate you doing that. But walk us through, you know, 
sort of the aftermath, you know, the debrief on this, you know, from a knowledge sharing perspective and, and, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, just how impactful this was for you as a professional who, you know, has been doing this for a while. And then you were able to, you know, sort of have your little uh, bevy of professionals uh, with you, uh, you know, experiencing this at the same time. I, I wish everybody could do this. It is, it's absolutely transformative. And it's not just transformative because you get to see these amazing spaces. Like uh, there's Giuseppe Gressi in the, uh, in the photo there, what they learned from Sevilla uh, or what Belen Bacali told me uh, about learning from Barcelona and the super ilas that are popping up in Valencia. But it's meeting these people, all of these people Everybody has the same story. The same story is it's really, really hard. And we pushed and we pushed and we pushed and look what we got. And then sometimes look at what we're trying to protect. <laughs> and to me, those, those stories really resonate. And I wish everybody could sort of experience that because where you are, wherever that is, you have the same potential. And when you get those victories, boy, it's sweet. It's really good. But in, in this image, we have to learn the right lessons. Uh, so I also went to Madrid and they've got these giant sharrows. I was just watching the Vuelta uh, de España. Uh, it finishes actually, I think, on this particular street. And they've got these aerial images from above and you see the world's largest sharrows. And what the largest world's largest sharrows do is they get some people to ride, but you don't have that diversity of demographics and people. And so it makes it okay I wouldn't ride there, but you could. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't create that transformative city space like you see in, in other cities like Sevilla. Yeah. And and to be clear, too, you know, because the Dutch and the Danes and others have shared space as well. But the difference is, is that the motor vehicle speeds are much, much lower. I can pretty much guarantee you that people will be speeding. If they're driving on this street, they're not going to be traveling at non-lethal speeds of 30 kilometers or less. And so it's not a very inviting environment when yeah. you're on the, the idea like was that they create one lane that goes at those speeds. And if you can see like the, the image is cut off, but they like that's the, I, I don't know if it's 30 or 20 kilometers, but the one lane is supposed to be slow speeds. But when everything around it is yeah. higher speeds, yeah. it doesn't feel safe and, and it really doesn't work very well. I, I could land yeah, an I, aircraft. I, I, and if you see the, the picture, actually it's 30, Billy. 30, uh, okay. 30 kilometers an hour, not miles an hour. Okay, that has to be said. The thing there, the thing there is that that cyclist has uh, fast speed cars on his uh, left and a fast bus in taxi lane on his right. It's just crazy. Yeah, and, and, and there's a lot, of, well, there's some people that, that, that defend this kind of, of infrastructure, you know, it's just crazy. And, and you know, the experience is it's just another. You know, Valencia and Barcelona have been doing a really, really great, great job in the last eight years. I, I think those, those two are maybe the most uh, remarkable cities right now in Spain. Uh, taking into account Pontevedra, Pontevedra and, and Vitoria in Spain, but maybe Vitoria and Pontevedra are smaller cities, but big cities, uh, Valencia and Barcelona, uh, have been doing a really remarkable and really great job uh, taking space from cars. Yeah, Giuseppe especially and Valencia, all that team from Barcelona and from Valencia, they, they're awesome. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Billy, uh, we're right at an hour right now. So I'm going to uh, get to this slide so you can just give a little bit of love to your group that uh, was with you on this uh, iStep project. Go ahead. Yeah, we had we had a great group, a diverse group of North American professionals who joined us both in the Netherlands uh, and then in Spain. And then really the sharing that we experienced in Barcelona, Valencia and Sevilla was extraordinary. Uh, and I, the, that's, that's where I want to send my love <laughs> because wow, it was tremendous. And those stories, you know, it, when someone visits your city, it takes time and energy. People go back with those, with those stories and they share them over and over and over again. And it really resonates. And so I just want to thank everyone who was, who spent the time and energy and particularly Manu for showing us around. Wow. Just transformative. And I hope that that comes through, uh, in this video today is, 
is these lessons that we experience, you can experience them too. And it really requires this sort of push. And if uh, and then I'll, I'll put in a plug for uh, for our webpage, uh, International Sustainable Transportation Engagement Program, uh, over at the Texas State Political Science website. Uh, we share some of those stories, and we're we'll actually be pulling together a story map uh, that includes a lot of this information, uh, so that you can look at what's happening. We have a story map right now on adaptation, urbanism, best practices. So you're able to look at these individual locations and and learn from them. And that that's the whole idea is about sharing those experiences. Fantastic. And, uh, and we already established that, uh, you guys behaved yourselves and, and, uh, you know, Manu, uh, was like, yeah, yeah, uh, okay, well, we we'll, we'll welcome them back again sometime. I'm, I'm just going to play a little video here of, of you, y'all riding down the road there in Seville, uh, and give you guys an opportunity to have some final uh, reflections. Manu, why don't you go ahead and, and, and chat a little bit about uh, uh, final uh, final reflections? Send our audience off with a few uh, words of wisdom. Well, one thing I have to tell you is that I'm losing my hair. Actually, <laughs> that's <laughs> the first thing I saw in the video. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that, and you know that's a really uh, uh, something to uh, to care for. And you know that's a piece of the new infrastructure. Mm. It's almost three meter uh, wide, and really easy to use, really straight with no detours at all in the inter- intersections, and really easy to understand. No paint at that point because uh, in the first stage, the uh, the lane was painted in green, all of that. But right now it's only painted on those places where we have the interaction be- between the bus stops and the pedestrians crossing, and and you know uh, it's it, th- that's. That's what we, 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 that's what we call or we think it's the second phase for refurbishing the infrastructure in, in Seville. We wrote a, a master plan in 2017 that was proposing actually that kind of, of, of refurbishments all around the, uh, you know, the pieces of the network that we had more traffic. And actually, it's, 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 it's nothing new. If you want more people cycling, you need capacity. It happens the same with the cars. If you give them capacity, you're going to have more cars. Well, if you give capacity and easiness, if that word exists, uh, for cycling and from riding, you're going to have more uh, more cyclists. Again, all everything integrated into a more broader sustainable mobility policies. We have to understand that we have to limit the possibilities of the car. Well, uh, this this uh, video uh, loop that's going through here, uh, Manu, reminds me, I, I probably should send you a, an active towns hat. You need to cover that up there. You're going to get sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> that would be much appreciated. Very good. Billy, final thoughts. Yeah, as I said before, just uh, I, I hope that uh, from this experience, people uh, see, see the possible. Uh, and the possible with bike lanes and a connected system, but then also the possibilities of public space. And one of the real lessons from Spain, and I, which I just love about Spain, is you open up a space and people will uh, uh, immediately start using it. There's this real culture of using public space that's maybe different than the Netherlands. And that's something to really learn from. Uh, when we open up public spaces, we have so much potential for people to start using them and you connect that to active mobility and wow, things can really get, you can really transform your community in a in a short time to someplace really different. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, again, I, this is mostly selfish of me just wanting to be able to experience the great stuff that you guys uh, uh, experienced and the wonderful time that you had together. Uh, so once again, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns channel. Thanks so much. Muchas gracias, John. That's it, as always. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this Reflections video with Professor Billy Fields and Manu Calvo. Uh, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you are enjoying this content, please consider becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just go to the website, click on the support button, and you can become a patron, uh, which by the way, if you are a patron, you get access 
access to all of this video content uh, early and ad free. Nice little bonus. Uh, as well as you can buy things from the Active Town store. I've got some good stuff out there, like, you know, streets are for people, uh, swag, t shirts, water bottles, all that kind of good stuff, coffee cups. <laughs> Absolutely necessary. Uh, and you can also make a donation to the nonprofit, which uh, helps out a great deal with some of my pro bono work that I do for cities. Uh, and hey, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.